God will bless your name. Thank you once again for bringing us together. Thank you for the Bible study tonight. We bless your name for all who are here. I will thank you for all your children who are gathered everywhere, listening and studying together with the people of God here. We're asking, O oh Lord, you open our eyes of understanding, even tonight in Jesus' name. We pray that our study will be beneficial to us personally and will give us real strength in the spirit. Give us backbone in our Christian life in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, that we will not bend or yield or compromise with the enemy or the persecutors. But the more persecutions may come, the more we'll stand for the grace and for the godliness and for the glory that is to follow in Jesus' name. Help us to be awake tonight as we study your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Tonight we are in 1 Peter chapter 4. And we are reading from verse 12 all through to verse 19. 1 Peter chapter 4. Reading from verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fairy trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evil doer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall then be of them that will be not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer According to the will of God, commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Tonight we are looking at the word of God on this subject, the glory in partaking in Christ's sufferings. We have sufferings there. There are many kinds of sufferings. There are the sinner's suffering. But there is saints suffering as well. There is the suffering of the people of the world. And there is the suffering of the people of God. That's what is referred to as Christ's suffering. That is because you belong to Christ. Because you are born again. Because your sins are washed away in the blood of the Lamb. Because there is a mighty change in new creature you are in Christ. Because you are identified with Christ. And you have experienced the grace in Christ. And you're a child of God. And your name is written in the book of life. And the Spirit of God is bearing witness in your heart. That you belong to Christ. There's a kind of suffering that comes along with that. And then you're a partaker of that suffering. Because you're a possessor of His grace. And because you delight in the will, in the word, in the way of the Lord. That's why the suffering is coming. But then He tells us, it's not just the present suffering. It's a glory that is to follow. That's a reward that is to follow. And there is the appreciation of the Lord, commendation of the Lord, reward from the Lord that is going to follow. The, the suffering is temporary, but the reward, the glory is eternal. Now, it's surprising to some that in a passage we are talking about suffering, 
about persecution, about pain, about pressure, about all the things the people of the world will try to do against our lives. At the same time, we're talking about joy. We're talking about rejoicing. We're talking about exceeding joy. We're talking about gladness. We're talking about being happy and being excited. And we're talking about the glory of God and the glorifying of the Lord. They all go together. That shows you already that the word of God is different from the ideas of the world. You know, in the world, if there's any suffering, then your heads are bowed, your shoulders are down. Then all the joy and excitement is taken away from your facial appearance. You are moody, you are gloomy, you are sorrowful, you are sad, you are crying, you are weeping, the tears are flowing. And what's happening to you because I am suffering? That's how the people of the world handle their suffering. But the Christian is different. He looks ahead, he says, because of this, I'm going to be like Joseph. Because Joseph suffered, and then at the end of it, see the exaltation, and see what the Lord has done. And the people, the people of God are happy when there is persecution. They say, hey, I'm like Isaiah, who prophesied about the coming of the Lord. The persecution is there, but then the joy of fulfilled life and fulfilled prophecy, it will come. I mean, in fact, like the Lord Jesus Christ who suffered. And when he suffered, then we see now his name is all over the world. And then many people, thousands, millions of people coming to the Lord. That's the glory that follows. That's why the Christian is not bothered. That's why the Christian is not sorrowful. That's why the Christian is not sad. Because of suffering, he says, I'm suffering this for a purpose. Therefore, I'm going to be glad. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to rejoice with exceeding joy because the glory will follow. And that's why the, the, the text is saying, don't count it any strange thing. Concerning the trial, concerning the testing, concerning the persecution, concerning the suffering that comes as if something strange happened unto you. And let's back up a little and look at how some even Christians, some Christians, how they approach persecution and suffering and difficulty and the challenges that come to them. The first thing they do is that, first of all, they are surprised and they are wondering why. Why is this so? When I be a real child of God, why don't you look at Jesus? Why was that so when he was the beloved of the Father? Why don't you look at Paul the Apostle, the greatest of all those apostles and preachers? Why is this so when I was living a righteous life and doing the will of God and spreading the word of God everywhere? Why are you asking why is this so? Think about James and think about Peter and John and see the persecution that came upon them. Think about Paul and Silas when they were right in the center of the will of God. Persecution came and so we shouldn't be like those Christians who are ignorant. And they have this erroneous view or idea that once you become a child of God, a Christian, you are really born again. You're not just a church goer warming the bench in the church. You are really, really born again. Then they think all persecution and forms of suffering will end. Don't think like that. In fact, there's even some ministers and preachers that think like that. Do you see all those posters outside on our streets? They're going to have a seminar. They're going to have a summit. They're going to have a conference. They're going to have this great meeting. And when you come to that meeting, all suffering will be ended. All attacks and all afflictions are over. Come to this meeting at this particular time, in this particular place, and we promise you that, you know, when you come for that meeting, there will be no persecution, no pain, no suffering anytime. You see the ignorant people watching there? Because they believe that. They believe the poster more than they believe the Bible. They believe those posters and handouts more than they believe Christ. That is their goal. That is their God. The God of the Bible is not their God. Because, you know, if you believe in the Bible, you believe in the Word of God, you believe in all the things the Lord has revealed to us. We are going to believe that when you become a Christian, anyone that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer. Tell me persecution. Why then are you running to this place or running to that place? I just discovered a book. Buy that book. If you read that book, no more suffering, no more persecution. I just discovered a CD somewhere, a DVD somewhere, a case somewhere. Once you listen to this, all problems are over. 
There's nothing like that. It's all deception. The word of God makes it very clear. It is through much persecution and much suffering and much tribulation we're going to enter the kingdom of God. You know, when you are deceived that there's no problem, there's no persecution, when the persecution comes, you are not ready. You are not prepared. But the people who are prepared and they understand we're soldiers for Christ. We have something to endure. We're more than conquerors. If you're going to conquer something, there's a battle. You're a warrior. And because a warrior, you're a fighter, you're fighting a good fight of faith. Because of that, all those challenges will come. But you have a backbone and you have a mind. You can keep your strength. And you can really do what the Lord wants you to do. Because, you know, persecution will come. Opposition will come. The trials will come. And you are ready. I pray you'll be ready. And in it, through it all, you'll be more than conquerors in Jesus' name. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14. Acts, chapter 14. We're looking at verse 22. Acts, chapter 14. We're looking at verse 22. They're confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them that uh, to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. See all those apostles of the Bible, in the Bible they were not deceivers. The apostles of today, many of them, apostles, they're deceivers. The preachers of today, many of them, deceivers. And then they say there's no problem, no trial, no temptation, no persecution, there's no pain. Come to Christ and come to our church and come to our ministry, come to our fellowship. And all those problems are over. The word of God says that through much tribulation that we get into the kingdom of God. I pray you will not be deceived in Jesus' name. In Second Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 12. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. It says, Yea. And all that will live godly in Christ shall suffer what? Persecution. That's the word of God. I thank God you are studying the Bible. Thank God you believe the Bible. Thank God you are not having any expectation that is contrary to the word of God. Persecution will come. Get ready. God will give you grace to overcome in Jesus' name. I'm looking at First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 13 there. First John chapter 3, verse 13. Mabel not, my brethren, if the world hits you. Mabel not, my brethren, if the world hits you. If you're a real child of God, that's going to happen. They hated Jesus Christ because they hated what he stood for. It's not your official appearance they hate. It's what you stand for. It's your conviction. That's what they persecute. It's your lifestyle. That's what they persecute. It's because you are different. That's what they persecute. It's because your life is bringing conviction on them. Makes them uncomfortable. You are righteous, they are righteous. You are heading for heaven, they are heading for hell. And you stand for righteousness, and they stand for unholy attitude. That's why they are persecuting you. But if they love you, pity on you. If they love you. Because it means that you are not a real child of God. If they love you. If everybody is saying good, good things about you, know she is good, he is good, is nice, she is nice. We like a kind of practice of Christianity. That means you are false and phony. Look at Luke chapter 6. In Luke chapter 6, here are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Look at it in verse 26. It says, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. You see that? If you're a real child of God, there will be somebody that will not appreciate your stand. Somebody that will not appreciate the doctrine you stand for. There will be somebody that will not understand, that will not understand and will not appreciate or support the kind of life you live. If you're a real child of God, but when everybody is appreciating and praising you and they are thinking, you're doing all right. If Satan praises you, they're afraid you're on your way to hell. If evil spirits and people that possess, are possessed of evil spirits, all those witches and wizards, if they appreciate you and they're praising you, 
You should understand that you are not on the right way to heaven. And if all those sinners and corrupt, defiling, defiled people, if they are praising you and they appreciate you and they say, I love him, I appreciate him, if those sinners are praising you, there's something wrong with your life. Look at that verse 26 again. It says, want you. When all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. If you're a preacher and everybody appreciates, everybody praises you, something is wrong with your preaching. And that's what the Lord is leading us to this study and is telling us that there is suffering that is going to attain the real Christian man, the real Christian woman. The suffering, this persecution that is going to attain the real Christian preacher, whether a man or a woman. And then there's suffering for those who are standing right and standing righteous for the Lord. And if you are ready for that, you know the suffering of combo is nothing. The Lord, be, the Lord will give you the victory in Jesus' name. We're looking at this study under three perspectives. Number one, we're talking about the purpose of participation in Christ's suffering. There's a purpose to that. Don't lose the purpose. Number two is the privilege and preservation in Christian suffering. The purpose. The preservation, the privilege of Christians who suffer. Number three, the peril and punishment of chastened sinners. Let's come to number one, the purpose of participating in Christ's sufferings. We're looking at chapter 4, First Peter chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 12. First Peter chapter 4, we're looking at verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange. Concerning the fairy trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with what kind of joy? Exceeding joy, surpassing joy, overflowing joy. Joy that passes understanding. Now you see it says, Beloved, think it not strange. You know what? There are some people that think it's strange. They say, if there's persecution, if there's suffering, maybe something is wrong with my life. That's like Joseph saying, If my brothers who are not real, com really committed to God, if they hate me and they sell me to slavery, maybe there's something wrong with me. No, Joseph, nothing wrong with Joseph. That's like Daniel saying, if all those people gang together in a conspiracy and they want to throw me in the, in the last den, maybe there's something wrong with me. No, there's nothing wrong with Daniel. It's like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saying, look at all this fire, look at the fairy trial coming upon our lives. And there must be something wrong with us. No, there's nothing wrong with you. Everything is all right with you. All that is wrong with the Nebuchadnezzar and all those conspirators that reported them. And so it says, when those trials come, be like Joseph. And be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And be like Daniel. And don't think because people oppose you, because they speak against you, because they slander you, or because they persecute you that something is wrong. Nothing is wrong. That's why it says don't count it strange. When those very trials come upon your life, that you're still beloved. Can I show you that the people in the Bible that were persecuted, they still remain beloved. It says, look at the verse 12 again, how the verse started. It says, beloved. Think it not strange. Beloved. Who are the beloved? Let me show you. Daniel chapter 9. I'm looking at verse 23. Beloved. Beloved. If you are really going to take part in this, that is, you are going to rejoice that these sufferings, they are not for some kind of backsliding attitude, backsliding behavior that you have. It's not because you did something wrong, you are being persecuted. It's because you are beloved. You'll be like Daniel. Look at Daniel. Daniel chapter 9 verse 23. Beloved. It says in verse 23, At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth. And I am come to show thee for thou at greatly beloved, greatly beloved. That's Daniel. What do we learn about Daniel? Number one, uncompromising. When we say beloved, those uncompromising people, they will not compromise with sin. 
They will not compromise with backsliders. They will not compromise with worldly people. They will not compromise with whether king or whoever. And they are going to take their stand. They are men and women of conviction. Men and women of the world. Uncompromising. That's why it says they are beloved. Number two, they are uncorrupted. Uncorrupted. You cannot corrupt them. Because Daniel made up his mind. He was not going to defile himself for the portion of the king's meat. Therefore, when we say beloved, they are people that are uncompromising. Number one, number two, they are uncorrupted. Number three, they are unwavering. Unwavering. You see, if you do that again, and you take that style, and you pray again, we are going to throw you in the lion's den. And then Daniel will pray three times a day with his window open towards Jerusalem, as he did a full time. Unwavering people, steadfast people. These are people that know the Lord. So when he says, Beloved, for you to be counted as part of that, you check up your life. Am I uncompromising in the world, in my office, in the school, in the community? Am I uncorrupted? Look at all that is happening on the streets. Look at the lives of the people. Are they able to corrupt me or am I uncorrupted? Before you can say I'm beloved. Are you a person that is some way burning? Whatever threats and whatever threatens, you're still taking your stand. And whatever winds may blow, and whatever storm may come, you're still taking your stand. Those are the beloved people. Beloved, uncompromising beloved people, uncommon beloved people, undefiled, undefiled uh, people that are beloved, or way burning beloved people, uncorrupted beloved people, think it not strange. That some things are happening to you when you're persecuted. Look at chapter 10 of Daniel. Daniel chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 11. Daniel chapter 10 verse 11. And said, he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved. Those are the people. Those are the people. That's why our passage is saying this one is directed to those who are like Daniel. They're saved. Those who are like Daniel, they're separated. Those who are like Daniel, they're sanctified. Those who are like Daniel, they're single-minded. To see the people like Daniel, he came, you have come to the Lord. You have confessed all your sins, and then you dropped all those sins at Calvary. And now you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are born again. Your life is different. Number one, you're saved. Beloved, think it not strange. That all these things are happening. Number two, you are separated from the world. Don't you, don't you see Daniel, a man greatly beloved? He was separated from all the filing uh, diet of the land. All those things in Babylon, he would not take part in that. He was separated. Number three, he was sanctified. You can tell about the life of Daniel. He was a really pure person, holy person, righteous person, holy through and through, within and without. He was a sanctified man. He was a single-minded man. A single-minded man. And it is when you are like that, you are saved, you are separated, you are sanctified, and you are single-minded. It is then you are referred to as a beloved brother, beloved sister. I'm looking at chapter 10 of Daniel. Daniel chapter 10. And there we're reading from verse 19. And said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. He said, greatly beloved Daniel, fear not. Let's look at Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. And I'm reading there from verse 9. Colossians chapter 4 verse 9. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother. Who is one of you? A faithful and beloved brother. You see, when we say somebody is beloved, a real child of God, he is unbending. He is unyielding. It does not yield to all the things of the world. You know, there's some people that they, they move with the wind. The wind blows them here. The public opinion now is to dress like this. That's where they dress. And when public opinion changes now is to give bribes, then they give bribes. And then the wind, another wind of uh, whatever it is, is blowing. That's where they follow. They don't have any backbone, no foundation. They're not born again. They're not real children of God. The real children of God are the people that are able to plant their feet on the solid rock. And then they have a real backbone and whatever wind may be blowing, they say, here is where I stand. Others may, but I will not. Those are the beloved of the Lord, and I pray the Lord will make you like that in Jesus' name. Can I have a good, good amen? 
uh, look at first peter now first peter now you understand first peter chapter 4 now you understand verse 12 what he's saying about the beloved he says beloved think it not strange concerning the very trial that means the test that means the persecution that means the suffering that means what the people of the world will say and do against you. It says concerning that very trial, which is to try you. And then I see if some strange thing happened unto you. Then it says, what's to be your attitude? What are you to do? As a real child of God. Look at verse 13. It says, but rejoice. It says, rejoice. They slander you. They talk against you. They tell lies against you. Then you are not in a corner somewhere. I will not go out anymore. I will not show my face to the public. Because everybody believes all the lies they are telling me about me. Everybody believes all the words of slander. Everybody believes I'm you know, like a criminal. Because of that I will not. It says no. It says rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering. Look at the kinds of suffering you have. Is it of a criminal of Christ? If it's of Christ, then come out and show your face and walk and, and walk free. Because if you are free from sin, you ought to be free from shame. It's only those who are not free from sin that are not free from shame. If you are free from sin and free from all the sins of the world, then you are free from shame and then you are able to live your life and say, here is where I stand. And whatever accusation, false accusation may come against your life. You know in your conscience, in your heart, you are a real child of God and you belong to Christ. And it says because of that, you are rejoicing. And then it says when his glory shall appear. Then also will you be glad with exceeding joy. I pray that will be your portion in Jesus' name. I'm looking at First Thessalonians chapter 3 verses 3 and 4. First Thessalonians chapter 3 verses 3 and 4. That no man should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves. No. That we are appointed there unto. It says nobody should be moved. You know, sometimes it's not even that you are suffering persecution or suffering any kind of trial. There's a brother. He's suffering persecution. There's a brother. All the tenants are saying something bad about him. And then there's a sister. All the people around are saying something bad about her. But these are beloved children of God. They've not done anything wrong. And yet their neighbors are saying some dirty things about them. And then uh, sometimes you say, I'm even ashamed to go to the same church as, she, as she's going to. I'm even ashamed to go to the same church he's going to. Because see what they're saying about him. See what they're saying about her. You do not allow that to move you. Said That's why it says in the verse 3, we told you before, that we're appointed unto these things. We're supposed to have all this suffering and all these slanders and all these lies heaped upon our lives. Therefore, do not let that surprise you. Look at verse 4. For verily... When we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and uh, you know. I pray that you will stand. That all these things will not move you. They will not move me. They will not move you. They will not move us in Jesus' name. You will not be fainting because of the persecution and because of the trial and because of what the people are doing or what the people are saying and the rumor that is flying around about you and the things they are saying. Once you know you are right with God, that's all you need. Because God is greater than a million people. God is greater than 100 million people. You, know, you don't know what they have heard about me. Or what they are saying about me. About 10 people are saying this about me. And I know it is not true. How does that worry you? If God knows you are right, if Christ knows you are right, if your conscience knows that you are right, that's all you need. Because all those ten people who are there, a hundred people who are there, a million people who are there, whoever they are, God is greater than all of them. And the commendation of God is greater than the condemnation of a million people. That's why you square your shoulders and that's why you stand with a backbone. That's why you look at people eyeball to eyeball and say praise the Lord. The Spirit of God bears witness in my heart that I'm a real child of God. Whatever other people feel that will be their business. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 16. For which cause we faint not, we will not faint. 
I said it will not fade. You know, it's the people that you know, inside their hearts, they themselves are feeling condemned. They're not sure of their lives. They're not sure of their behavior. They're not sure of their Christian experiences. They're not sure they're really saved. They're not sure that if they die at this moment, they'll go straight to heaven. And since already they didn't have any assurance that they are really going to heaven, and then they are doubting themselves as to their lives and their behavior and their character, anything people say will make them faint. Maybe it's true I'm not a child of God. Maybe it is true I'm not born again. Maybe it is true I'm a wicked person. Maybe it is true what the people are saying. When you have the assurance of the Spirit, you're not going to be thinking like that. All you need is go back to Calvary and go back to the altar and lay everything down at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ and have that cleansing all over again and then have the Spirit of God bearing witness in your hand that you're a real child of God. There will be no fainting anymore in Jesus' name. That's why it says, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. In verse 17, for a light affliction. All that Paul the Apostle went through, he said, that's a light affliction. Shipwreck, that's light affliction. All those uh, conspiracies of 40 people wanting to kill him, he said, that's light affliction. All the stoning, he said, that's light affliction. All the imprisonment with uh, Silas, that's light affliction. All those, all the Jews, the, all the things the Jews were planning against his life, he said, it's a light as flick, affliction, as light as feather. And I'm going to and that bother me. And a real man with a real backbone is not going to allow the shaking or the movement of a feather, the feather of a bird, to move him. It's only a light affliction. When you are a real child of God and you have foundation in Christ, and you are saved, separated, sanctified and single-minded, looking unto Christ, the author, and the finisher of your faith. All those things happening, there will be light affliction. It says, for a light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. It said, because of the reward coming, because of the commendation coming, and because of the joy eternal coming. And because of what the Lord is going to do on the final day. When he examines us and he sees that he says come into the kingdom. That is prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He says when we see that then there is exceeding joy. That's why he says while we look not at the things which are seen. But at the things which are not seen. But the things which are seen are temporal. Shipwreck temporal. Persecution temporal. And all the things of conspiracies of persecutors temporal. All the pain on the body temporal. Even the sickness temporal. Even the poverty temporal. And it's taking away of you know your job or whatever. All that is temporal. It says there's something eternal. I was thinking about that eternal thing. We're thinking about that thing that will never end enduring unto eternity. That's why it says that the things which are seen, tangible things, visible things, the temporal, but the things which are not seen, what are they? Eternal. They are eternal. Those are the things to think about. We're looking at uh, First Peter chapter five. First Peter chapter five, verse ten. But the God of all grace will give you grace. And he says, my grace is sufficient for you. Whatever you are going through. Persecution, pain, suffering, slander, the lies of the people. Or they throw you somewhere where you should not be. He says, all those things, God says, his grace is sufficient for you. You will not be crushed in Jesus' name. You will still stand firm with your feet solidly on the rock of ages. And your back will be like real iron so that nothing will move you in Jesus' name. Then it says, who has called us to eternal glory. Always understand that. Whatever it is now, some people say, He has called me to prosperity. That's a small thing. That's earthly. That's temporal. He's called us to eternal glory. 
Other people say, it's called me to this position, this privilege. All that is temporary. They are only on earth. But it's called us to eternal glory by Christ Jesus. And it says, after that ye have suffered a while. That's on earth, a while. That's only here, a while. That's the present time, suffered a while. Then it says, he'll make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. That's all the amen you can say. You know, when you think about what the Lord has said and what the Lord is going to do, then you really rejoice that there's nothing to worry about. The suffering, number one, is to teach us patience. Number two, it is to make us learn obedience. Number three, this suffering is to keep us away from pride. You know, if you're all the time in the sunshine, there's uh, everybody is saying good, 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 and you're wonderful, you're likely to be proud. But sometimes God allows this suffering. Number three, to keep you from pride. Number four, to restore us from dangerous Parts. Sometimes you are going the wrong direction. Do you are saved, you are born again, you are a child of God. But then you are forgetting yourself. You are becoming careless. You are becoming prayerless. And because of the carelessness and the prayerlessness, the Lord allows some suffering to come. And the thing brings you away or brings you back from the wrong dangerous past. Number five, sometimes it's to prepare us to comfort other people. If you have never suffered, never experienced any hardship, never experienced any pain, other people are going through pain, you don't know how to talk to them. But if you've gone through it, you'll say, I was there. I went through that before. And this is the passage of scripture that helped me. When the waters almost swallowed me up. That's what helped me. You're able to comfort other people. Number six is to prove the depths of your love for God. God allows that to know. Whether you'll stand or you'll backslide. Look at Job. Have you considered my servant Job? He's a righteous man. A perfect man, he has choose, he shuns evil, no man like him on the earth. And then Satan said, ah, I know, but you have circled him and hedged him around. If you touch what he has, then he's going to deny you. And God said, I'll prove it to you that Job is not going to deny me. That's why he permitted that. In your life, some things are permitted so that God will prove, will prove it to you and prove it to everybody around you and prove it to the devil that you will not backslide and you will not backslide. And then Satan came back and God said, Where have you been? I've been going to and fro and up and down on the world, on earth. Have you seen my servant Job? Even though you moved me against him to destroy everything that he has, he's still standing, ah, skin for skin, flesh for flesh. A man will give whatever he has for his body, for his health. You touch his flesh and he's going to deny you. All right, go and do that, but don't touch his life. And then you were told what Satan did. It was to prove. That Satan's, that Satan's lies are real lies. And that Job's righteousness is real righteousness. And he did that. And then we're told that Job never sinned with his mouth. Because of those things that happen. I pray that when your time of proving and testing comes, you will not fail in Jesus' name. Number seven is to prepare us for greater, better, higher service and ministry. Number eight, it is to make us partakers of God's holiness. I want you to look at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12, when some of those things happen, it's not to make you decrease in holiness. It's not to make you decrease your commitment to the Lord. Oh, I was, you know, I was, I was saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. And since this thing came upon me now, everybody talking about me. I don't even know how to increase or how to even continue in holiness anymore. No, that's the wrong attitude. If you have been saved and sanctified by the grace of God, you are a new creature in Christ and you are holy. And then persecution comes, slander comes, opposition comes. And all those troubles come against your life. It's to make you increase. In the holiness the Lord has given you. You say, I'll dig a little deeper, rise a little higher in this holiness, in this purity of life and heart. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. We're reading there from verse, from verse 10. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10, it says, For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers 
of his holiness. We are partakers of his what? Holiness. That's what he's to do. And thank God for holiness. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And if the Lord see that holiness is not at the level it ought to be, and also to be more holy, more righteous, more pure, so that you can get nearer and nearer to heaven, then he allows those sufferings and that will drive you on your knees and say, Lord, examine me and check up on me. If anything, I'm, say, I'm compromising, anything I'm doing which is not proper and right and perfect, oh Lord, let me see. And then with prayer, because of that suffering, it makes you more righteous, more pure, and more holy. Look at verse, look at verse um, 11 there. It says, Now, not just standing for the present, seem to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, after watch, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. You see what the Lord is saying there? That when you exercise and when you stand in that suffering, it makes you to be able to have more holiness, more righteousness, and the Lord will do it for you in Jesus' name. Point number two, now we're looking at the privilege and preservation in Christian suffering. That while you are there, God preserves you. You know, persecution never destroys real faith, genuine faith, or real experience. If somebody has a real experience of salvation, Persecution is not going to destroy that. Ah, they want me to backslide. They're going to make me backslide. Are they stronger than God? Are they stronger than Christ? Are they might shed on the blood of Jesus? How can they make you backslide? It's God who has saved you. And what he has begun, he's able to finish and finalize it. And so you, can, you cannot say, those men are so powerful, what they're doing will so crush me that the grace of God and the salvation of the Lord will not be effective in my life anymore. There's nothing like that. He preserves the righteous. He preserves those who are saved and those who are sanctified. He preserves us in that experience, whatever people do. They are not greater than God. They are not stronger than God. If God is still God, if God is mighty, if God is almighty, if God is strong, if God is a person, is a, a God that will never, never lose a battle, then in that persecution is going to support and sustain you in Jesus' name. I want you to look at it now in First Peter chapter 4. I'm reading there from verse 14. First Peter chapter 4 verse 14. If he be reproached, what does that mean? If ye be insulted, if ye be abused, if ye be slandered, for the name of Christ, happy are ye. It says this is for the name of Christ. It's to exalt the name of Christ. It's to spread the name of Christ. It's to make more people know about the name of Christ. If you are reproached, if you are insulted, if you are slandered, if you are persecuted, if you put heap sufferings upon you for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and the spirit of God rests upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part is glorified. It tells us then it's a glorified sin or it's a glorifying sin, a glorious sin to suffer. Suffer for righteousness. But understand, it is for the sake of Christ. For the sake of his gospel. For the sake of righteousness. That's very important. If you suffer, if you be put for the name of Christ, for the sake of Christ. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 5. You must be able to know the reason why you are going through what you are going through. If you be reproached, not because you have sinned, not because you are backsliding, not because you stole, not because you committed adultery, not because you committed fornication, and the church wanting to uphold righteousness will say, uh uh, see what you've done. And then there's some kind of review, chastisement. That's terrible. So you'll not be going around and smiling and rejoicing and saying, they said, when we are persecuted, that one is not persecution, that one is church discipline. But if you are righteous, and what's happening to you is for the sake of righteousness, and for the sake of the name of Christ, it says, rejoice. Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 10 below. It says, blessed are they which are persecuted. Why? 
for righteousness sake not for unrighteousness not for stealing not for adultery not for fornication not for evil not for being a busy body not for being a gossip but biter no it says you're persecuted for righteousness sake then it says in that verse 10 for this is the kingdom of heaven blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake you see that for my sake not for your sake not for the sake of money not for the sake of embezzlement but for my sake if it's for the sake of christ that but that persecution of pain is coming then it says rejoice verse 12 it then says rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you remember that's for his sake i'm looking at uh, chapter 10 matthew chapter 10 we're looking at verse 18 so you look at your suffering you look at the persecution look at all the slander all the lies they tell against you all the hatred all the malice all the antagonism all the opposition you say why are they doing that it's because you are righteous ah uh -uh, then i'm happy why are they doing that it's because you have a stand for righteousness for christ then i'm happy why are they doing that it's because you are preaching the gospel and you are involved in this dawn and then many people are coming to christ through you and they don't like that that's why they're persecuting you then i'm happy you're happy because they persecute you for doing good chapter 10 verse 18 it says in verse 18 and you shall be brought before the governors and kings for my sake that's it for my sake not because they bad an evil report concerning you for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Look at verse 22. Verse 22. And you shall be hated of all men. Why? For my name's sake. That's why when you are going through any kind of persecution or oppression or whatever, pain or suffering, you say, for what sake is this one? Why are you doing this? Because I stole somebody's money? Why are you doing this? Because I cheated in an exam? Why are you doing this? Because, uh, you know, you did something wrong? If it is not, if it's for his name's sake, then you can rejoice. And the grace of God will multiply more and more in your life in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Luke chapter 21. Only for his sake, only for his sake. Make sure that if they're slandering you, if they're backbiting, if they're gossiping, make sure it is because you're doing something righteous, something pure, something good. That's the reason why they're doing that. And then you can rejoice. Chapter 21 of Luke. Luke chapter 21 verse 12. It says, But before all these, they shall lay hands on you and persecute you delivering you up to the synagogues and into the prisons being brought before kings and rulers tell me the rest for my name's sake if it's because of his name you know that's a good name that's the greatest name on earth and the greatest name in heaven and if that's the reason why the persecution is coming say this is good this is great that God will count me worthy of all people to suffer for his name's sake. Look at Acts of the Apostles. Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Reading from verse 16. Acts chapter 9 verse 16. It says, For I will show him how great things he must suffer. Why? My name's sake. I'll show him. You know, some people will say, you know, that Paul the Apostle, he did quite a lot of wrong things in the past. Even though he's not born again, now preaching the gospel, that's why he's suffering because of what he did in the past. No. God had forgiven him all that. The Lord said, I'm going to show him how great things he will suffer for my name's sake. 
And then the Lord continued to reveal what he will do. Look at Second Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12. We're reading from verse 10 there. Evaluate and examine the kind of suffering you are going through. Why are you going through that kind of suffering? Is it because you've done evil? Because there's something wrong in your life? Check out. If there's nothing wrong, and the Spirit of God is still bearing witness, you're a real child of God, you're living a holy life, a righteous life, a sanctified life, then you can rejoice to know that they're doing this for His name's sake. Look at Second Corinthians chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 9 and verse 10. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. You'll find the grace sufficient in Jesus' name. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. I am weak, and they are doing this. Will they not kill me and crush me and destroy me? No, they cannot. Because his strength is made perfect in weakness. It isn't that uh, Joseph was so strong. It was the strength of the Lord that was made perfect in his weakness. It wasn't that all those people, Sheikh, Meshach, and Abednego, were so strong. No, it's because the grace of God was sufficient for them. And the same grace that was sufficient for them will be sufficient for you in Jesus' name. And Daniel was a great man, a strong man. No, it's the grace of God that made him strong and great. And that same grace is sufficient for every one of us. Whatever happens, if you are really born again, you are a real child of God, it's not just a make-believe. It's not just that I was born in the church. Uh-uh. That one is not being born again. It's when you go to, the, to Calvary yourself, and then you get to the cross of Jesus Christ, and you lay all your sins at the feet of Jesus Christ, saying, Lord, I want to be born again. I want to have this experience of salvation. And then you are forgiven, and your life is cleansed, and your life is changed and transformed and turned around. And then you can say, I got it. I got it. Now I have that salvation. I'm born again. It is that that makes the grace of God to be abundant in your life. And then you go back to school or go back to work or go back to your community. And the people will see that your life is different. You have joined those people. You have become like them. We knew you were going to their church, but we didn't know that you were going to take on their lifestyle or the experience, or the way they do things. But now you've got to say, yes, I got it. We're called to being born again. I'm born again. I'm now a real child of God. Then persecution will come. But look at that verse. It says, my grace is sufficient for you. Give me a good amen. amen. And then it says, for my strength is made perfect in witness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Look at verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. That is, when those persecutions come, I don't, you know, sit back and say, I will not go out. I will not see people's faces. I'm going to go to Asia. I'm going to go to Philadelphia. All these other places, Pamphylia or whatever, wherever you wait, I'm going to go here. I'm going to go there. They persecuted and stoned him. He rose up again and he went and he kept on doing what he ought to do. He said, because I'm taking pleasure. I rejoice in that now. I pray that that same attitude, the Lord will give unto you in Jesus' name. And then he says, I take pleasure in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. That's the word for Christ's sake. For Christ's sake. For Christ's sake. And then he says, for when I am weak, then am I strong. The Lord will make you strong in Jesus' name. We're looking at Second Timothy now. Second Timothy, I'm looking at chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1. Verse 12. For the which cause I also suffered these things. It wasn't ashamed. You know, some people are ashamed to say they are suffering. If I say huh, I'm suffering, they'll say, what's wrong with you? I'm not suffering. <laughs> Those who are not suffering, they ever have any persecution. There's something wrong with them. But you, so there's nothing wrong with you. You are righteous. You are saved and sanctified. And living a holy, sanctified, righteous life, that's why the persecution is there. And so you should not be ashamed. Paul, the apostle, was not ashamed. said, for which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. He'll keep your life, he'll keep your soul, he'll keep everything you've committed to him in Jesus' name. 
But then he tells us in the word of God, this is not Hebrews, what you have to do at such a time when those challenges are there. For you to be able to stand, don't look at those people, don't look at the things they say or the things they write against you or the things they do against you. He tells you what to look at and who to look at. Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, I'm reading to you there from verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, we're looking at verse 2. Looking unto Jesus. That says it all. Looking unto Jesus. That's, that's where our strength comes from. Looking unto Jesus. That's what makes the persecution light. Looking unto Jesus. That's what makes us to be able to spring and to be able to move ahead and see if there's no problem at all. Looking unto Jesus. If you look at your enemies, they look bigger. If you try to recollect what they say against you, they like to look, they appear stronger. If you look at all the conspiracy, how many of them want you, you are counting them. Don't count them because they are nothing. And when you count many zeros, they are still zeros. In the sight of the Lord, they are nothing because they are like the dust of the ground. I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, a hundred. They are one hundred zeros. But God is the mighty one. God is the one that will never fail. He's never lost any battle. Don't look at those zeros but look at your God looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and he sat down at the right hand of God at the right, at the right hand of the throne of God for consider him that's what you have to consider that's who you have to consider don't consider all these people the things they say they don't even know how to use language properly. Don't consider that. But you consider Jesus Christ. It says, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Lest he be weary and faint in your minds. If you are considering the wrong thing, you'll be weary, you'll be faint in your mind. But when you consider the Lord, you'll not be weary. You'll not be tired. You'll not faint. You'll go from strength to strength, from glory to glory, from faith to faith in Jesus' name. Point number three now, the peril and punishment of justice sinners. Remember we're in First Peter. We're now in First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. What are you doing from verse 15? First Peter chapter 4 verse 15. But let, non, let none of you suffer as a murderer. As a seed, or as an evil doer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Those are sinners. Look at all the people, they are murderers. What do they use? The knife, or the gun, or chemical. Whether they're killing through abortion, or they're killing somebody who's already born. Murderers. Those are sinners. Then it says, Oh, you see. Whether they're stealing a little amount or say a big amount, whether they're stealing through the internet, internet scam, or they're stealing by pilfering, whether they're stealing the boss or stealing on the net, anywhere they're stealing, whether they're stealing in the church or stealing at home, they're thieves. And when they suffer, and suffering will come. If it doesn't come now, it's coming later. It will, it will come on earth, it will come in eternity. It says, when you suffer like that, you are suffering as a sinner. And then, or an evil doer. Workers of iniquity. Well, they're doing iniquity secretly. There are some subtle people. Subtle, sleek, and sly. They sleep. They're very slippery. You can never catch them. But they're evil doers. They're evil workers. And they know how to wrap their lies. That you'll never be able to detect that this is a lie. But they're evil walkers. They're like parasites, like, like snakes. They, they sleep through the grass and you cannot discover them. You cannot tell. But they are there and although they are slippery and sly and sleek, they do evil. And you'll never be able to ask Mr. So and so, it's Mrs. So and so, or it's Madam So and so, or it's Master So and so that did this. But they do evil. But no matter how clever you are, 
God knows all the evil doers and all those evil doers they are not born again they are going to suffer on earth and they will suffer in eternity I pray you will not be a part of them in Jesus name and that's why we will come here so that the word of God will find us out search me O God and know my heart today and see if there is any evil any defilement any uncleanness any iniquity in me cleanse me and make me whiter than snow you will do that in Jesus name and it talks about these people now busy bodies in other men's matters they don't they're not busy about checking their lives about looking at their lives all they are busy about is talking about other people thinking about other people slandering other people their busy bodies in other people's matters their houses are not clean and they're complaining about the houses of others that are not clean their own doorstep is defiled and they're talking about other people whose yards are defiled they are busy bodies in other men's matters. It's like a person is a failure himself and he's talking about the failures of other people. He's a criminal himself, he's talking about the crimes of other people. He's a sinner himself, he's talking about the sins of other people. He's an adulterer himself. And he's talking about the adultery of other people. A fornicator herself. And it's talking about the fornication of other people. And they can talk and they can preach and they can say whatever. It's all saying. They themselves are dirty. And then they are busy bodies in other people's matters. And when you suffer like that, you say you are suffering as a sinner. I pray that God will get us separated out of that kind of gang and company in Jesus' name. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, for the time is come that... The judgment must begin at the house of God. Say what? House of God? Yes, because you know, there's an Achan in the camp of the people of God. That's why the judgment will start. In the house of God, some Achans are there. There was an Absalom in the household of David. Yes, there are some people like Demas in the household. And there are some people like, uh, like Hannah and Sapphira. They are there. And because they are not dropped dead, they say, come in and come in out. I'm also consecrated. I'm also a Christian. I'm also a child of God. I'm also sanctified. I'm this and that. But they are Ananas and Sapphira. There's a Simon, the sorcerer. And he's following after Philip. And he's going about and he's beholding everything and saying, I love this. I like this. I, I will consecrate. I will give anything to have this. They're talking about consecration, but they're sinners. They're backsliders. That's why it says that judgment will begin in the house of God. And you think about yourself, are you an Achan there? And then you're taking a wedge of gold, you're hiding it somewhere, and nobody is seeing it. Are you an Absalom there, out there? You appear humble. Somebody wants to greet you. Don't, don't worry about this. I'm just like you. If they make me like, uh-huh, there you are. Place seeking. Seeking for position. If they make me like, and I'm saying I'm there. And you see when you come here, you come there, you're here and there. Because you're looking for something. And if you don't get what you're looking for, then you turn the other side and begin to backbite everybody and pick against everybody. They're not looking at our tribe. They're not looking at, at, at this and that. Why are they doing this? Why am I not there? I'm better than so and so. Uh -huh. You are the one to blow your trumpet. You are better than everybody else. You are there and you are just like Absalom. That's why it says the judgment will begin from the house of God. And then it says in that verse 17, and if it first begins, is at us. What shall there be of them that obey not the gospel of God? There are some people that are coming day in and day out of the people of God. They don't have any transformation. They don't have any salvation. They don't have any obedience to the word of God. They hear all the teaching. They hear all the preaching. They hear all the doctrine. And they attend all the meetings and attend all the studies. But there's no change. There's no change. And the glory is not just coming to the Bible, so the glory is in going back to, you know, to on your knees and saying, I've had that today. I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty. Oh Lord, cleanse me. Oh Lord, change my life. It is when that change takes place. That's when you escape judgment. But if you're just coming every time and hearing everything and seeing everything, even participating with the people of God, but you do not obey the gospel. That doesn't serve anybody any good thing. That's the reason why it says that we must understand that sinners are going to be punished on that final day. I pray you'll not be a part of them. 
I said you will not be a part of them. In First Peter, First Peter, chapter two, verse twenty. First Peter, chapter two, verse twenty. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye you take it patiently? If ye be buffeted for your faults, why should there be any fault there? Look at Daniel. No fault in his life. Faultless, spotless, holy, righteous, sanctified. If God did it for Daniel, He'll do it for me. I said He'll do it for me. I said He'll do it for me. Will he do it for you? Say that. If God did it for Daniel, he'll do it for me. He'll change your life, change your heart, and change your attitude. And that's the beauty of studying the Word of God. The study of the Word of God is to make a change, a transformation in our lives. So that when the day of judgment will come, we will not be partakers with those people that are going to be judged. Because God has made a change, a transformation in our lives. That change will take place in Jesus' name. Uh, look at uh, look at Second Peter chapter two verse twenty. There are some people they knew the Lord before, and, and while they are coming to Bible study, I think that uh, when you bring uh, something near fire, then that thing will all the corruption will dry off, and all the worms will dry off, and all the, it will not be smelly and stinking. But you know, there are people. The more they come, the more they stink spiritually. The more they come, the more they still offensive and sinful and unfaithful. And the more they listen to the word of God, it appears the more they are getting farther away from the Lord. Why should it be like that? Look at Second Peter chapter two, verse twenty. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they again entangled therein. Again entangled therein. I'm just wondering, somebody came to, you know, Sunday service, and then the following day came to Bible study, and then two days after came to Thursday revival, and then two days after went to Saturday meeting again. There's no time to even commit sin, and yet you'll find that somebody comes on Sunday, and then before he comes on Monday, it's going go into adultery and fornication. I'm wondering, what happened? You just, you had the word of God yesterday. You had the word of God just the other day, and before the next meeting, when did you have chance to commit sin? And then you come on Monday, you hear all this word of God, and between Monday and Thursday, they are going to steal. And I'm wondering why? How can that be? That you just had the word of God on Monday like this, and how did you have chance to even do that? If you are by the fire every time, and the fire of the word of God is burning on Sunday or Monday, and then you're having your quiet time every morning, Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and... Where would, where would you be able to commit sin? But to see some of these people here, it says, they escaped with the knowledge of Christ, and then they again entangled in and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. I pray that will not happen to you. Uh, you, you know their problem. Let me show you their problem in Second Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. This is their problem. I pray this will not be your problem. Give me a good, good Amen. Second Timothy chapter three verse seven, ever learning, ever learning, they never miss it. Bible study, ever learning, they never miss it. Sunday scripture, ever learning, they never miss it. House fellowship, ever learning, they never miss it. Revival, ever learning, they never miss it. Conference and retreat, ever learning, they never miss it. You know they're listening to cases, they're listening to everything, but ever learning and never able, ever learning, never able to get saved. Ever learning, ever able to get sanctified. Ever learning, never able to resist temptation. Ever learning, never able to rise up and move on their way to heaven. Ever learning and never able to have a change of life, a change of character, a change of disposition, a change of habit. Ever learning and never able to walk in the path that leads unto glory. Ever learning and they're never able to shift. They're never able to shift from the broad way to the narrow way that leads to life. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I pray you'll not be like that. You see, when we learn, it will bring us to the knowledge of the truth. That that knowledge of the word of God will bring conviction. That knowledge of the word of God will bring confession. You say, I learned that. That's my life. 
I've learned that. That's something I've discovered I shouldn't be doing. I've learned that that should not be the pattern of my life. It brings conviction about one number two. It brings confession. And then it brings real uh, consecration to the Lord. Lord, I lay that down. I'll never touch that thing again. I'll never go in that direction again. I'll never look there again. It brings consecration. It brings conversion. That's what brings the grace of God into our lives. And then we're changed and totally committed unto the Lord now. Because we're not one of those people that are ever, ever, ever learning and never able to have a change of life, a change of heart, a change of attitude. I pray that God will help us to be obedient to the gospel of the Lord in Jesus' name. And then when we're obedient to the Lord like that, you know what he's going to do? He's going to make us to decide that whatever happens, I'm going to keep on my real Christian virtue. There'll be a willingness to suffer, willingness to suffer that I'm taking this decision. Whether people agree or not, this is what I'm going to do. That's how people become real Christians. That's how they remain real Christians. And it needs to be willing. Now, whatever the yoke and whatever the pressure, whatever the oppression, whatever this, whatever it is, the enemies want to do, I'm going to stand for that. You are then willing to suffer as a Christian. You are willing to suffer as an uncompromising Christian, not just a wishy washy Christian, ordinary Christian, just church going Christian, but you are willing to suffer as an uncompromising Christian, as a sanctified Christian. That I know that, you know, my neighbors will not like that when they want to contribute money for this. And I say, I've count me out. They're going to prosecute. I'm ready for that. You'll be willing to suffer as a sanctified Christian. You'll be willing to suffer as a fruit-bearing, soul-winning Christian. Not just ordinary Christian. A soul-winning Christian. You're willing to suffer as a militant Christian, triumphant Christian. Your own Christianity is not like, you know, secret Christianity. I'm going to play it cool and play it gentle. I'm not allow them to know my heart or my conviction. But you're willing to really stand. And you are a kind of militant Christian, triumphant Christian. Let me show you what the Word of God says. It says in First Peter, let's come back to this, First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. It says in verse 16, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, what kind of Christian? Uncompromising Christian, that's the only kind of Christian that suffers. An unwavering Christian, that's the only kind of Christian who suffers. An unbending Christian, that's the only kind of Christian who suffers. An unyielding Christian, a steadfast Christian, that's the only kind of Christian who suffers. A person that says, I've made up my mind, I'm going to live like Christ, I'm on my way to heaven, and nothing is going to stop me or turn me around. Those are the people that suffer. And you must have that kind of willingness that you're going to suffer like that. A sanctified Christian, that in your heart, in your thoughts, in your mind, in your life, in your disposition, everything within is cleansed and sanctified, and you're courageous, a courageous Christian. Those are the people that actually suffer, but then they can bear it because they have the stamina to bear that kind of suffering. You'll have that stamina in Jesus' name. Uh, I want you to look at uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, verse 41. Acts chapter 5, verse 41. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame. For his name. They were counted worthy. They were happy for that. Happy that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for him. And did that stop them? Of course, no. Look at verse 42 and daily in the temple. And in every house they ceased not to teach. That's what they wanted to stop. They wanted to stop them teaching and preaching the name of Jesus Christ. But it said they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. Those are real Christians. I pray you'll be a real Christian. I said you'll be a real Christian. Not just a counterfeit, a wishy washy one, a church God that is not born again, but somebody who is born again already knows the Lord and loves the Lord and is living for the Lord. In Second Timothy chapter three. Second Timothy chapter three, I'm reading from verse twelve. Yea, and all that will live godly, you're willing to live a godly life, no matter what others think about it. Because you know the people around us, they don't know what we know. They have not studied what we are studying. 
They don't know about salvation, about sanctification. They don't know about holiness and purity of heart and life. We know about it. And because we know about it, we're going to live at, at our level. We're not going to live at their level. If you have knowledge, live at the level of your knowledge. You're not going to live at the, at the level of the ignorant people around you. It's like a teacher. A teacher has knowledge. He's not going to live at the level of the ignorant students who do not know what he knows. And therefore, you want to live at the level of the knowledge you have, the knowledge of salvation, the knowledge of sanctification, knowledge of holiness and purity of heart and life. Live at that knowledge. And it says, uh, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Verse, uh, verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. While the evil men are waxing worse and worse, Christian people are waxing better and better. Stronger and stronger. Greater and greater. In their conviction. You see, if the people of the world are going worse, then we who are in the Lord in Christ should be getting better. If they are getting worse in their evil and getting worse in their persecution, we should be getting stronger in our resisting all their temptations and trials. But it says that then in verse 14, it says, But continue thou. In the things which thou hast learned, and hast heard, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. We are going to continue in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. Revelation chapter 2. And I'm reading here from verse 10. It says in Revelation chapter 2 verse 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Amen. It's like God telling uh, Joseph, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. They are selling you to Egypt. It's actually going to fulfill the dream I gave you. Their persecution, they're driving you. It's actually going to fulfill the dream I gave you. It's like telling Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that fear none of those things that Nebuchadnezzar is trying to do. Because when he makes that fire and throws you into that fire, you are going to see a sign you've never seen. The Messiah, the Christ, is going to come. The Son of God is going to come to you in that fire. Therefore, don't fear the fire. Look at the same beyond the fire. Fear none of those things which are going to suffer. It's like telling Daniel, don't fear all the lions dead. Because if you don't get to that lion's dead, you're not never going to see an angel in your life. And the first time you saw an angel was when they threw him in that lion's den. And the king rose up in the morning and said, Daniel, is that God whom you serve able to deliver you from those lions? He said, oh, kingly forever, my God has sent an angel all through the night. He muscled the mouths of those lions. They could not hurt me. Fear none of those things who are going to suffer because it's going to lead you to more glory and more protection and preservation and the blessings of God in your life in Jesus' name. We're not afraid. We're not afraid of persecution, slander, whatever it is the people of the world are doing, or whatever they're saying. That's why it says, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil that's all he is. The devil shall cast some of you into prison, that she may be tried, and that she may have, and ye shall have tribulation. How many days? Only ten days. Think about that. Ten days out of 365, that's small. Ten days out of, you know, the 70 years, 80 years, 100 years, you're going to live on earth. That's small. Ten days in comparison with eternity. All that is small. It's only for ten days and let's be thou faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. That's what you'll be looking at. Not at the cross, not at the, not at the problem, not at the persecution. You're looking at the crown of life. The Lord is going to give you. Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And, and see what the Lord is saying. The assurance the Lord is giving us. Hebrews 11. I'm reading there from verse, from verse 25. Choosing rather to suffer. He even made a choice. This is Moses. You know, they gave him the choice. Do you want the pleasures of Egypt or want the suffering with the people of God? He said, I choose suffering. I am willing. Willing to suffer. These were people that knew the goal of life. The reason for existence. And he said, I'd rather choose to suffer. It says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Listen to 
this for endured as seeing him who is invisible. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. Look unto Jesus. He is invisible to other people, but you will see him. He will be with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. In that challenge, in that pain, in that persecution, He will keep you standing steadfast and faithful to the very end in Jesus' name. And let us rise up in prayer. Let's talk to the Lord that the Lord Himself will strengthen us. Like He strengthened other people, He strengthened us. He sustained other people, He sustained us. He supported other people, He will support us. And, but make sure that you are really saved, you are really born again. And the Spirit of God is bearing witness in your heart that you're not just a church goer, not just a member of deeper life, not just I was born in deeper life, not just that I you know, go to church every time, that people that are ever learning, but then they're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth of salvation. You tell the Lord, oh Lord, I want real, real salvation. And if the Spirit of God is bearing witness in your heart that you are really born again, then you rejoice, then you say, Persecution may come, but I will stand. I'll be a Christian. I'll be an uncompromising Christian. I'll be an uncommon Christian. Not just a kind of ordinary Christian like every Dick and Harry. I'll, I'm going to be an uncommon Christian. You tell the Lord, help me Lord, help me Lord, help me Lord. I'm going to be an unwavering Christian. Unwavering on bending, on yielding. I'm not going to yield to pressure. I'm not going to yield to evil. Don't allow people to make you concentrate on them. That's what the enemies like. That's what the adversaries love. That's what the persecutors want. They want you to be looking at them every time, thinking about them every time. They don't want you to think about Christ your Savior, Christ your Lord, Christ your Sanctifier. They don't want you to be looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. They show up every time, they talk every time, they call every time. They show their faces every time. They shout at you every time. They want you to hear them more than you hear Christ. Don't give them attention. They want you to forget who your God is. And just remember how great they are. How big their idols are. How hot their furnace is. The enemy wants you to be thinking about them every time. Looking unto them every time. They want to capture your attention. Make you their slave. Don't even mention their names. So and so is doing this against me. So and so is planning that against me. The more you mention their names, the greater they appear. But there are nobodies. My persecutors, my enemies, my adversaries, my opposers. You talk about them more than you talk about Christ. You look big, and that's what they want. You're feeding their pride. Look unto Jesus, the other one, the finish of your faith. Does anybody who should be thinking about, should be thinking about Christ, Christ as Savior, Christ as Sanctifier, Christ our Healer, Christ our Baptizer in the Holy Ghost, Christ our Provider, Christ our Redeemer. Christ our deliverer, the Lord my shepherd. Think about him. 
looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. He also on the finish of our faith. Don't look at these present things. Christ and Christ alone. Savior. Sanctifier. Healer. Baptizer. And the coming King. Don't allow Satan to take a moment of your life thinking about him. Don't allow evil doers to take a moment of your life. Your time is too precious to give it to those persecutors. Your mind is so priceless and precious to give any attention to those persecutors. Count them as nothing. Count them as not existing. Count them as a nobody. Let your God become greater, higher, bigger, stronger. Your mind focus on Christ. Looking unto Christ. Looking unto Christ. My grace is sufficient for you. His grace is sufficient for you. His truth is sufficient for you. His strength will mighty your weakness. Can help you to stand. He will help you to stand. Let the main thing be the main thing in your life. Your salvation, that's the main thing. All those enemies, they're not so important. Heaven, glory, the future, destiny, that's the main thing in your life. Your passport to heaven, salvation, sanctification, holiness, that's the main thing in your life. All the other things are non-essentials. A friend, that's a non-essential. I won't be your friend anymore. That's not that's not essential. What can they do to rescue you from the judgment of eternity? Those friends are not essential. No man on earth, no woman on earth is indispensable to you. Christ, Christ only, Savior, Redeemer, Lord and King, Sanctifier, The giver of all grace. That's the real, important, indispensable person in your life. Looking on, unto Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. But for the joy that was set before him. despised the shame endured the suffering and I want to pass that grace unto you if you are not saved so you can be saved if you are saved but not sanctified so you can be sanctified prepared 
made ready for heaven. Don't forget, look away from all those persecutors. They are not that important. Don't give them attention. Look unto Jesus. He will help you. He will carry you through. Yes, I know you have been richly blessed by this message. Do feel free to order for more of Pastor W.F. Fumi's messages and enrich your life, family, business, ministry, and the world. Special packages include our MP3 series on the book of Daniel, Hebrews, Revelation, James, Believer's Life series, Power series, Leadership Strategy Congress series, Love series, Victory series, Christian Marriage and Family Life, Faith series, Consecration series, Prayer series, Salvation series, Holiness series, Yoruba messages, and much more. Messages are available in DVD, VCD, CD, MP3, tape, and MP4 formats. For further inquiries, contact Life Tech Limited, 3 Ayodele Okelbo Street, Mugado, Lagos, PMB 1004, Yaba, Lagos, Nigeria. Email lighttapes.hq at deeperlifeonline.org. Telephone. Remember, a message a day keeps the devil away. God bless you.